Welcome everyone. This is Ashley Tomney from the Crystal Lake Public Library. We are here for our Open Books, Open Dialogue program and I'm very excited about it. I have three other wonderful people that I love talking about books and feelings with and um, let's get started. Who else is on here with me? I'll go ahead and go. Uh, I'm Dr. Ruper from School District 47. So excited to be joining everyone on the screen today because there's nothing more that I love uh, than talking about books and to be talking about feelings today is, is so great. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. All right, I'll go next. I am Kristen Schmidt. I'm also with District 47 and I too love books. I especially love using them as a vessel to talk about emotions and feelings. So this is one of my favorite things that I get to be a part of. And um, I'm Dr. Melissa Katz. Um, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and the clinical director at Samaritan Counseling Center of the Northwest Suburbs. Um, I have two small kids that I feel like were raised at the Crystal Lake Public Library. Um, and we integrate story times and books into conversations daily about things that might feel um, uncomfortable or kind of hard to talk about. So I am also very excited to be here today to share with all of you some of those tips that we use. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. And welcome. I uh, talk about books a lot. I'm a librarian. I work at the Youth Services Desk and I go into schools. And I spent two hours this afternoon, one hour at the library with my son, and then an hour at Barnes & Noble with my son looking at books. <laughs> And I still don't even know what all is out there. There's so much more um, to discover. So um, I'm excited that we do programs like this to maybe point to some books you may or may not have been aware of and maybe some ways that you can use them um, with your families to help facilitate conversations. So when we talk about books, we often refer to different pieces of research that guide our discussions and what we think about. And one that we frequently come back to is the work of Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop. And uh, in her seminal work, she talks about how books are mirrors and windows and sliding glass doors. And, and what she means by that is, isn't it wonderful that literature can, we can reflect ourselves, we can see ourselves reflected in the books that we're reading, but we can also look through the window into somebody else's lives and somebody else's experiences. And, we can slide through that door and join in their experiences. So tonight, as we talk about feelings, I'm going to go through a couple of slides and share the covers of the books. And as, as we hear Jenny May is sad, think about the characters and, and how could you be reflected or whose, whose story are we looking into? When sadness is at your door, do you see yourself in this book? Do you see others around you? How can you relate? I'm happy sad today. Allie all along. The longest storm. And of course, my favorite, which is not popping up, is The Rabbit Listened. You'll see these books as we talk today. Think carefully about how you see yourself reflected or what windows you're looking through or what sliding glass doors you might be walking through. Thank you. Um... And that was funny, it, it landed right on uh, the longest storm when they were looking through a window. <laughs> when you said, what windows are you looking through? <laughs> Very well played. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna share a book with you and um, I'm gonna spotlight myself so that you can see it. And this is one that Stasia mentioned. This is Jenny May is sad. This is by Tracy Subasak. Jenny May is sad. My friend Jenny May is sad. But you might not be able to tell. Even when she's sad, she still smiles. Hi, pal. And shares her orange with Harold. And admires Izzy's drawings. And she really likes to make everyone laugh. Looks like she's pretending here. Jenny May is hilarious, her friends say. But some days are not as fun. 
Rip. No. Why did you do that, Jenny May? Today is one of those days. Back to your seats, please. Looks like they have an assignment on the board that says draw your family. Draw and write three details about your family. And on those days, I wait. And she's talking to her teacher. Jenny May says that Ms. Abbott is a good listener. She says, I'm a good listener too, but today is a quiet walk home. What we need are, we have enough change. We're popsicles. And kick the rock. Jenny May's tongue is blue. Nah. And mine is purple. Uh, I asked Jenny May, how, you, how are you doing? She doesn't answer. Being sad is hard. Jenny May is sad. But she knows I'm here for fun and not fun and everything in between. Because that's what friends are for. The popsicle is on the papers. <laughs> so that is Jenny May is sad. And I love this book because you could think about yourself as Jenny May, or you could think of yourself as Jenny May's friend, who's the narrator. And I think we've all been in both spots, right? Thank you, Ashley. You know, I feel like um, we are all growing up in a culture where we think about having positive and negative emotions. Um, and we think about like happiness and excitement as those positive emotions. And we want to feel those and we want to promote those. But when we talk about sadness, um, there's this tendency to brush it off or not tend to it as much because it makes people feel uncomfortable. Um, and we talk about that a lot in terms of um, like grief work. Um, it is really hard for other people to sit in that sadness with you. And so um, it's really important for us to create a culture where we're acknowledging it. When we talk about how to sort of regulate ourselves and teach our kids and even ourselves to feel these really big things, um, we talk about how to develop self-control and grow emotional intelligence. And kids of all ages um, really do need that experience of feeling the emotions and practicing um, kind of tolerating how those feel. And in the long run, that's what helps us to develop those. So emotional intelligence is this concept that sort of encompasses awareness of what the feeling is, understanding, and then the ability to express and manage our emotions in a developmentally appropriate way. Um, and so that regulation um, is really key. And it's important to think about how that runs in a developmental context. So we as adults should have the capacity to be able to problem solve and also regulate how we're doing in that moment. But younger kids cannot. Um, and so what we know about these littles is that um, not really until the age of four are they able to start sort of developing these strategies um, to eliminate things that feel hard for them and kind of cope. And so if you think about some of the sensory things a kid might do, um, if, if they hear a loud noise and that might feel scary to them, they have learned how to regulate that by covering their ears. Or um, if they're scared for something, what do we do? We cover our eyes so we don't see it. So it's not until four, we're starting to learn how our own bodies can adapt and sort of tolerate the situations around us. And then when kids are around 10, that's when they start to consistently be able to use some of those more complex strategies for emotional self-regulation. Um, and what we aim for is for these to be broken down into two seemingly simple steps or categories. We've got kids who attempt to solve the problem 
using problem solving strategies. You know, I feel this and this is how I could work on it. But then also um, those that are able to attempt to tolerate the emotion. So again, it's that distress tolerance of being okay, feeling not okay, and sitting with that while we're learning how to problem solve. And so how do we sort of build that awareness and understanding of the emotion and how can parents help our kids to sit with that? So John Gottman, who is a very famous um, researcher in couples work um, and in sort of connection of humans in general, um, talks a lot about um, coaching as a parent, your emotions in your child. And so parents who are coaches um, they value those negative emotions and they don't just pay attention to the things that are good. And they're also not impatient. So sometimes we as parents will say, you know, stop crying or you don't need to be sad about that or, um, you know, tolerate your anger or calm down or, um, you know, we, we try to make that emotion or that feeling stop pretty quickly. Um, and that is less than ideal. Um, we as adults um, should be using those emotional experiences to guide our kids, to help them label and feel those emotions and to help them navigate that problem solving. Um, and so kids who grow up with these parents or, you know, adults and caregivers around them who are helping them um, through that coaching um, end up um, being, you know, physically healthier. They tend to do better in school. They get along better with their friends. Um, and so there are a couple of strategies that we can use to make sure we're doing the best that we can for our kids as these emotional coaches. And let's be honest, right? Like if we're in a bad mood or had a bad day or stressed or overwhelmed, it is an unreasonable expectation for us to always be calm, healthy minded adults and individuals. And so sometimes we're really practicing our strategies before we go and help our kids. So naming our own emotions, right? Like I'm feeling this and how can I problem solve through it? And how can I label it before I'm going to go interact with my child? Um, especially if that sad thing happened to the family um, or that thing that's causing maybe some anger um, is perhaps, you know, a consequence or a result of the child's behavior. So really navigating that interaction and, and helping ourselves to sort of feel and identify and move on is really important before we're chatting with our kids. So if we had to break this down into a couple of strategies, um, a couple of things that we can do to help be good emotional coaches so we can help our kids develop a higher emotional IQ, if you will, be aware of our kids' emotions. We are paying attention to what our kids are doing and how they are feeling. And we're naming them and we're noticing them and we're in that space with them. Um, oftentimes kids, if they're not feeling attuned to, will sort of purposefully or not increase that emotion. And I'm not sure, I mean, everyone here has had tiny kids at some point. You maybe notice that like a child is crying and then you're not acknowledging them. And maybe they're looking at you and like checking in and then crying more or crying harder or yelling louder. That's a nice indication that we're not acknowledging them and giving them what they need in that moment. So saying something like, I see that you're sad. I'm noticing tears running down your face. Um, let's sit down together and feel that together is really important so that these kids um, feel acknowledged and don't necessarily need to amp up that emotional expression. We can see emotions as an opportunity for connecting and teaching. Um, they should not be presented as an inconvenience or a child or as a challenge. Like, oh, shoot, my kid's angry again. Oh, darn, my kid's sad again. Um, think of it as um, an opportunity to connect with your kid um, and coach them through that challenging situation. Um, listening and validating feelings. Um, I see this a lot, and I know Kristen's going to speak in a little bit to um, working with adolescents and older kids, um, but we are working to form that connection at a very early age and let kids know that their problems are also important. Um, and in the back of my mind, if um, little Eloise did not get the color cookie that she wanted, I'm thinking, dude, like, 
really not a big deal in the scheme of life. Let me tell you about my day. But in her four-year-old mind, that's really important to her. And that's very disappointing. And that's where she is in that moment. So letting her know that I hear her and, and reflect back to her, gosh, it must be really hard when you um, don't get what you want. That's super disappointing. I'm sorry that that happened for you. We see you and we're experiencing this with you. And then we're working to label emotions with kids, um, especially the little ones. They might not have the vocabulary um, for their emotional expression. And I don't know about you guys, but I've seen all of these like emotion wheel pillows um, and there are feelings and expressions of feelings on there that I'm not even quite sure what they mean. And so we think a lot about the basics, you know, happy, sad, angry, surprised, but there is a wealth of different words out there that could specifically capture how that child is feeling in that moment. And then our job is to help our kids problem solve, but with limits. So all of our emotions are acceptable, but all of our behaviors are not. So it's okay to feel these feelings, but it's not okay to express them in the way that you're doing so right now. And we talk a lot about like, safety and sort of shutting, shutting things down or behaviors down as they're happening and they might not be appropriate, but we're still narrating. We're going to feel this with you for a bit of time. And then we have to clean it up and carry on. And we can come back to it later if we need to, but for right now, we got to get it together. And how could we do that? And if it comes back, we'll work on it again. But, it, but it's time. So helping them to define, you know, how big is the thing and how much time does it require in order for us to be able to um, feel better and then kind of move on. Dr. Katz, I have to jump in. As you were talking about listening, I just started drifting back to the book. I don't know if you guys did about Jenny May's friend saying that her teacher is a really good listener. And that was so important in the book and so important to kids. So thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Well, and, and Dr. Gruber, I feel like too, like we as adults feel like we have to fix or problem solve. And sometimes the best thing we can do is just be right. And so that teacher listened and the rabbit listened in that book. I mean, that is the whole function of that beautiful story. No one had to do anything. You're just there. Yeah, I was thinking that um, Jenny May's friends have a lot of emotional intelligence to understand. We can do some popsicles and kick the rock. Um, and I can ask how she's feeling, but if she doesn't respond, I'm not going to get my feelings hurt. <laughs> and it's funny when you were talking, I was thinking too, um, as we talk about older kids, it's really not that much different. It's so like when you're talking about it for four year old, not having the color cookie they want is a big deal. Absolutely. For a teenager, uh, a friend not being inclusive with them or somebody not liking them that they're interested in, you know, romantically in some way or um, not getting to do something that they want to do or whatever it is, things that you're like, it's really not that big of a deal in your own head. It, and for them, their emotions are very big, especially with hormones and everything else. And so things are like catastrophic and you have to deal with really big mood swings, which to your point, Dr. Katz, you have to check your own emotions because while little kids are hard in their own right, the teenager mood swings, I think, are so frequent and so big that like you feel like you're on a ride at all times and you never quite know where you're going to be and it's up down all the way around like you know there's a reason why parents joke around like I'm I am a terrible person I said good morning today <laughs> you know and we make jokes about teenagers because they really are hard it really is they don't know how to navigate their feelings and at next step in life of trying to, they're going to that next level where feelings feel different and emotions expand in a different way from the simple emotions that younger kids have to more intense emotions because instead, instead of being like mad or sad, now you're disappointed and now you're, um, you're offended and you're, and you're, you're feeling affronted by something, you know, like things that just have like the more complex emotions and they don't know what to do with that. And they still have this youngness about them, 
where it's like, I'm mad, but you're really not mad. You're more than mad. Like it's something else. And it's teaching them how to dig a little deeper, understand the complexity of emotions. And I think, you know, having a line of communication open with them means that adults, no matter what position you're in, whether you're a teacher or a parent, you have to be really good with that poker face. If you look like you're responding, like they tell you something and you do the, or, or shock or disappointment or judgment or whatever else, they're not going to talk to you anymore. They're not gonna feel safe. And I can say with working with older kids and even now having older kids, there's a lot of my kids' friends that talk to me about things that they don't talk to their parents about because I don't judge. And it doesn't mean in my own head, I'm not like, whoa, but you have to really do a good job of saying, okay, let's talk through that. And you have to see it from their perspective. They're not telling you so that you can parent them, like, right? That's part of the journey of parenting or even working with older kids. They're telling you, and to your point, Melissa, that's why I say it's like it is the same but different. You're supposed to be quiet and let them sometimes just be as they're figuring it out and instead of imparting your wisdom or your judgment in the midst of that. So, you know, you can have really difficult conversations on difficult topics. And I talk to a lot of people, they're like, you know, big kids, big problems. And that's very overwhelming because people get very impassioned, like, but I have to teach you. Cause like, if you make this mistake or you do this choice, the consequences are huge. And while that's absolutely true, if you have that intensity to you, they're gonna back off. And the only place they're gonna go is other people who maybe aren't the greatest as far as, as being influencers, right? I mean, I want my kids to talk to their friends, but if they're only getting their advice from other 17, 18, 19, 20 year olds, we've got a problem. I want them to know they can come and talk to me and we can talk through it. And I can say things like, instead of me going, well, you shouldn't, or why would you do that? Like, so tell me what that could look like. And I think about like, like, really, really tough conversations with, with older kids. I think there's a lot of people who back away because they don't know, they don't know how to talk about things like drugs or alcohol or sexual activity or some of these big things that are, are really heavy conversations to have with older kids. And instead of saying things like you shouldn't do this, or you should do this, or this, you know, these, all these bad things could happen. It's better for when they're willing to talk about it a little. So what would happen if you did this? What would happen now? And what could happen? And you give them timelines to think that through because what happens today might be different than what happens a year from now if you make a certain decision. And, and what would that feel like? And, you know, and cause them to do some of the thinking because then they're, they're more apt to talk about the feelings that are usually attached with those things, right? They, they feel pressured or they feel like they want to be cool or they want to let loose maybe and, and be, have fun in some way. I just think there's a lot of similarities between little kids and big kids and what we say and what we do and how we respond to it. It's just harder to do the older they get, I think, because yeah. what they're saying has a lot more punch behind it. So it's, I think a lot of adults unknowingly shut down conversations because of their own emotional responses to what those bigs are telling us. Well, and I think too, Kristen, we forget about, or maybe don't know about that whole concept of the underdeveloped prefrontal cortex. Yes. So when our teenagers are crying to us that their life is over because their significant other bro broke up with them, it really feels like that to them. And we are like, oh my gosh, your, you know, boyfriend or girlfriend or partner of like three weeks, like, okay, like you probably weren't going to be with them forever, but it is our job to acknowledge where they are in that moment. And I think that is so hard for us to remember again, because we're dealing with our own really hard things and we see the whole picture, but they don't. Yeah. Um, I will never forget this therapy session will go down as like one of the best ever. I had a very, very upset teenager whose boyfriend just broke up with her like on the way to the office. And the parent was like, I'm so sorry, but I'm also so glad you're here with her. Um, like help, help us. We didn't talk at all about what was going on or what felt hard for her. I am notorious for keeping pints of ice cream in our work freezer. 
And I'm like, what do you need? And she's like, in the movies, they just cry and eat ice cream. I'm like, I got you. I got her a pint. I grabbed myself a pint. We each had a spoon. We just sat there eating ice cream. And after a couple of minutes, she just like, she just started going and we just sat there eating ice cream. And so I think we forget the best thing that we can do sometimes is again, just be. Um, I'm also, I want to add, I'm not endorsing um, like food as the only way to feel better. Um, but I, I am, I have been known to keep, keep some ice cream around. So Jenny May, Jenny May knew that the purple and blue popsicles were the way to go. So, you know, everybody's got their thing. Yeah. And it just makes me think oftentimes it's the sharing it with someone else that is, is more important than the actual popsicle or the ice cream or yeah. This is fascinating. I I have not spent time thinking about sort of, um, you know, toddlers, like three and four year olds and their emotions and some teenagers, but I, I see a lot of similarities. <laughs> a lot of similarities for sure. Just smellier and bigger, you know? <laughs> Like, especially if a certain emotion is harder for you, like maybe it's harder for me to be angry. And so when my child's angry, that's harder. Or maybe it's hard for me to be sad. And when my child's sad, that's like harder. What are the benefits to having the conversations with the book then versus like in the moment, like with your child? I could answer that a little. And then Dr. Katz, you jump. Um, I think the benefit is when you do it with a book, it removes you. You're the, you're the vessel of the conversation, but it's not about you having to come up with words or terminology or questions or prompting. You're just using the book to do all those things. So, so it almost naturally compartmentalizes your own emotions when a lot of times people don't have the ability to compartmentalize as much. I think that's something that human beings struggle with more times than not. And the book provides that naturally for you because you're you're just simply talking about the book and asking questions about the book or the character or whatever the case may be. What do you think, Dr. Katz? Yeah, I was thinking if you have um, a supply of books in your home or access to it or you're friends with brilliant librarians like Ashley Tomini, um, and you can anticipate an event that might occur in your family or as something is naturally occurring and you have the time and space to be able to utilize those resources, I think it levels the playing field. So um, we had a loss in our family and Ashley dropped off a book about, um, about death. And so I agree, Kristen, with what you're saying. Um, it allowed me to remove myself and the names of the people in our family and we could talk about the book but also give me the space to express my emotions also and talk about how I'm feeling as well and so the kids would ask questions like mommy does this make you feel sad you're crying um yes it's okay to cry when people are sad like this is how we feel our feelings if we didn't cry it might mean that we didn't love this person very much it means that they're very important to us and so um, I think that that's harder to do in a moment when you're yourself feeling like angry about something, but, um, you know, I have this cute book called sometimes I'm Bombaloo. Um, and so when you have shared those experiences with your child through literature, it gives you almost like an additional way to have a conversation with them, right? So I'm feeling Bombaloo right now. Do you remember that mask of anger that's put up in front of our faces when we're feeling Bombaloo? I'm gonna go take some space. And when I'm feeling a little bit better, I will come out and talk to you. So if you, you can pull from those past books that you've read in situations like that. Very good, thank you. Yeah, no, I don't think in the heat of the moment, you're gonna be like, let's read a story. <laughs> But I like that um, the shared language uh, is very good. Um, and I, I we have too. that here. Sorry, I just want to chime in. Like, <laughs> none of us are perfect. Like, we yell at our children. We get upset just because we have degrees or doctorates, you know, in how to do something doesn't mean that we do it. I think that the repair or the conversation 
is far more important than you perhaps demonstrating your own inability to um, regulate an emotion. So um, always in acknowledgement. Um, and, and again, I put my kids on an equal playing field, right? Like, hey, I just yelled at you in a really mean voice. I yelled so loud that my throat kind of hurts. Um, what do you think I could have done differently? What do you think I was really upset about? How do you think you could have helped me in that situation? So you're just sharing that conversation and you're turning them into the experts and then you're showing them that it's okay to feel what you're feeling and to apologize after. And I even take it a different step sometimes where when I'm managing something, I'm talking out loud about what I'm doing because modeling it, sometimes they miss it. And maybe it's me living with boys, but sometimes, you know, it's a little, it's a miss, right? And so I might go right now, I'm practicing not speaking when I'm angry. So I don't think things that will be hurtful because of how I'm feeling or something like that. Or right now, I am working on taking deep breaths because I'm feeling very, very frustrated or whatever the case may be. So they know I'm actively doing it. I'm pointing out that I'm actively doing it and, and on top of the modeling just to like maybe drive that home a little bit more. And sometimes I say things as simple as, you know what, I need a do over. And then I replay whatever just happened and show them how that looks. And my kids have asked for many do overs over the years. Because I say like, you know what, that was not my best work. So I need a do over. Tell me that again. And then they say something and then I reframe what I, you know, whatever my response is going to be. And we talk about that. And now my kids are older, right? So they both have had significant others. And I, I say to them, I'm like, oh, I, t I tell them they need to learn how to do do overs in a relationship. To have a healthy relationship, you need to have a do over because you're going to do and say things that are hurtful to each other, not on purpose because we're humans. So you ask for a do over and then you do it right, you know. So Kristen, how do you navigate that with sadness? Because I think that um, like if a child walks into a room and sees you crying, or I mean, if my child walks into a room and sees me crying, like the natural reaction is to like, be like, I'm fine, I'm fine. So how do you have those like out loud conversations? Like, would it look like, you know, like my body's feeling really tired today because I'm feeling sad. I might lay here a little longer. That's my body showing me that it's sad. Or like, is that, what would be some examples about like sadness that you could think of? I, I've talked with my, my kids, my own kids, and then older kids sometimes about what sadness looks like for individual people. So like maybe sadness for me is crying and sadness sometimes for somebody else comes out as anger or sadness for somebody else comes out as quiet. And, you know, and so I've talked with them about there's different ways that sadness comes out and then your toolbox has to be full of whatever, like for instance, so to your point, laying here a little longer might be a great tool for you because you know that's good for you whereas for me it's good to be outside maybe and for dr grouper she's like you know what i just need to do some reading and escape for a little while or you know things like that so i would i've talked to my kids about having to figure out um what are the tools in your toolbox and making sure your toolbox is pretty expansive because you may not be able to use a certain tool depending on where you're sitting at the time so like if i if i want to read and i'm nowhere you know nowhere that i can read or whatever that might be that i need to use something else you know or whatever the case may be but i like that example of being able to narrate it too because i'm sure dr grouper is always reading so if she's able to maybe say you know i'm feeling a little bit sad i'm going to go take some time to read that's my happy place you're acknowledging that that's what you're doing in that moment or like i'm feeling a little down i'm going to go for a walk outside so you're just differentiating between what might be a walk outside and then a way to sort of feel better about something just sometimes i think in general we forget to explain things to kids. So as much as I believe modeling matters, I think we put sometimes too much stock in the modeling without having the conversation about what it is we're doing, you know? Do you have, Ashley, do you have some books with you that you might want to share some other books besides the one we read aloud? Is um, When Sadness is at Your Door. And this is, um, you know, the child, and this is sadness, the blob right here. It's very 
or down. And so it's a, it's a short story, um, but the blob is in the story of sadness. So sometimes sadness arrives unexpectedly and follows you around. Sit so close you can hardly breathe. You can try to hide it. I love this, trying to stuff sadness into the closet. <laughs> But it feels like you've become sadness yourself. And so this is at recess and not participating and just inside the sad blob. Um, so try not to be afraid of sadness. Give it a name. Hello. Listen to it. Ask it where it comes from and what it needs. If you don't understand each other, you can just sit together and be quiet for a while. Find something that you both enjoy, like drawing, listening to music, drinking hot chocolate. Maybe sadness doesn't like to stay inside. Try letting it out sometimes. Go for a walk through the trees. You can listen to the sounds together. Maybe all it wants to know is that it is welcome. And to sleep knowing that it is not alone. So their sadness is the blanket. When you wake up, it might be gone. Don't worry, today is a new day. And then there are lots of images of different people, not just the child with sadness. I like the visualization of sadness as the blob. I know when we had done the previous program um, with Ruby Finds a Worry, that was helpful for me too, to visualize that worry. Um, so I liked that in this. Then I have Allie all along. Um, and this goes back to a little bit of, um, you know, the, the anger. So this is Allie and Allie is very angry because of something that happened. And this is Allie's brother. And you can see the mess that Allie is creating in her anger. Um, she's very frustrated and she's throwing a fit and smashing things. Um, her brother gives her a pillow to hit. And then the red suit of anger comes off and Allie comes out yellow. So got the worst of the angry off, but then Allie's still feeling ferocious and her brother gave her, and she couldn't say why. So her brother gave her a stuffy to hug. And then the yellow anger comes off and there's green. It helped a little bit more, but still she was irritable. And so take a deep breath, but don't hold it for too long. You know, pretend my fingers are candles and blow them out. And then that helped a lot more. So look, Allie has taken off all of these layers of anger. And Allie is blue. And so she's maybe just a little angry and sad here. And then count backwards from 10 and here is Allie. And I just love the visuals of after some sort of action that helps her feel a little bit better. She sheds that. Um, and then she wants a hug, <laughs> hug please. I mean, Ashley, that book just tickles my heart because as a psychologist, we talk a lot about how we have primary and secondary emotions and anger is a secondary emotion that serves to cover up primary emotions. And so I love that image of shedding sort of those layers to see what's really going on underneath. Yes. Thank you. Um, and then, um, Dr. Cass, did you have a shelter for sadness with you? Um, I don't know. Um, I believe I had it from the library. <laughs> now I don't anymore because I returned it like a good library patron. Good job. Um, <laughs> do you, do you want to talk a little bit about what you liked about it? If you remember, it's okay if you don't. Um, yes, I, um, sort of remember. Um, I love this book because, um, it embraces letting in the feelings um, and Ashley, you can narrate a bit as you're going, but um, this little peanut is not dismissing the sadness, not trying to cover it up, not trying to shove it out, 
but creating a space for it. And sometimes that space needs to be really big. Um, and as time goes on, the space is still there, but it it's needed less and it's further and further away. So I just, I love the idea of, again, it, it brings us back to like clinically distressed tolerance um, and just sort of being mindful and sitting with the things that feel hard for us. And then Dr. Gerper, did you have anything you wanted to talk about? You know, I didn't bring a book, um, but I do want to, there's one that I love to read a lot, a lot. And actually, um, Dr. Katz, I read this in Henry's classroom uh, last year when I, when I got to go visit. It's called In My Heart, A Book of Feelings. Um, and maybe we've talked about this in another one as well, but the reason I love it, oh, look at Dr. Katz is going to save the day and go get it for me. But the reason I love it is because it talks about so many of the big feelings that we have. And it offers the language that we can, that kids can use to name those feelings and in different times in which we might feel them. And so, you know, while books um, sometimes offer us, you know, that experience to go back to, it also offers us words that we can start using in our vocabulary. And this one is just that. Did you find it, Dr. Katz? It's in my sleeping child's bedroom and I'm not going to mess with no, that. I totally understand. <laughs> it's, mine, mine is boxed up in a box uh, waiting to go into my new office. So I don't have all my books available. It's um, the but sweetest, I did, most I, beautiful cover. It's this heart with all these colors around it. It's beautiful. Ashley, oh, look yes. at, now, now we're going to get Ashley to go see if she can find it because it is absolutely beautiful. And, oh, she's, she's got it. Look at, oh, well done. Yes, I love this one. I just love it. And it's so fun to read aloud. It's a good one for a group. And since I know we keep talking about, you know, making sure that people understand how to use it with how to use things with older kids too. What I would say is don't forget that like if Dr. Grouper is reading, I love listening to someone read to me too. And I'm old. So like just because we don't read to our older kids regularly, because that you do, you grow out of that. I'm not sitting down with my 17 year old and reading a picture story. But if you're in a situation and you're not sure how to navigate, it's an absolute go-to anytime. I can pull out a book even now if I wanted to, if it was something where I was like, I don't know what to do about that. I could find a book to give me that way to have the conversation, even with an older kid. And they're going to grumble and or grumble and they're going to roll their eyes and they're going to act like they don't want to do it. But you know what? I've yet met somebody who doesn't enjoy being read to now and again. So you can still use some of those things. Or if you really want to be sneaky because you have kind of a more of a stickler of a kid, you might just be sitting in your kitchen or wherever, sitting in a classroom and just start reading and seeing. You know, they're going to pick up on stuff even when they act like they're not engaged and they're going to, they're, they're, they'll pipe up a little bit. I used that not too long ago with my 17 year old where I wanted to talk about something and there, he wasn't having it. So I just started playing it when he was around and it wasn't that particular time. It wasn't necessarily a book. It was, um, it was someone speaking on something and I just started playing it. And he was like, he always, you know, he's totally disinterested, doesn't want to talk about it. And then he's like, well, what happens with this? And then what about this? So now all of a sudden he's asking a few questions. So it prompted a conversation I could have never done on my own. And I think you can use the books in that way too, no matter how old the student or the child is, depending what your role is, um, you can always use a book. What, what I love that Ashley and Dr. Gruber have been able to do for me in the past and will continue to do is give us books that can still pull for these kinds of things for the older kids and we can read them together. So if we created some sort of like book club or like here I see you going through this you might want to give this a read or or an audio book of it let's listen to it together in the car those are other really great examples of things that Kristen is sharing with us absolutely well this was wonderful um I always enjoy this time that we spend together and I'm excited that we are going to put this recording out for others to view no I just want to say thank you that was very enjoyable thank you to everyone here today